Hello, hello. Welcome back to Loki's Librarian. I am the librarian, Katrina. If you are new here, welcome. This is where I am reading through the enormous library books you see behind me with a dash of booze to make it fun for me. Then I give you a quick synopsis and I tell you what I think about it. So if you like books, just aren't sure what to read next, hit that subscribe button, like and share my videos, let me know what you think in the comments. Now, the last Sunday of the month is dedicated to learning about the presidents of these United States. And since this is the eighth month I've been doing it, we are on to the eighth president, Martin Van Buren, which makes this week's book of the week. Ooh, a lot of reflection there. Ooh, it's Martin Van Buren and the American Political System by Donald B. Cole. There we go, less reflection. Now you can see the title. Martin Van Buren is one of those presidents I knew almost nothing about prior to starting this journey. And while I learned a little bit about him from my book on John Quincy Adams, and then even more during the book on Andrew Jackson, this month's book taught me that politically he was known as the magician. So appropriately enough, I found a cocktail called the magician, and I will be mixing that up as we work our way through the story. I'm gonna need my instructions. Martin Van Buren was born on December 5th, 1782, so the country was no longer strictly a British colony. He was born in New York. Can I, can I hook? Hold on a second. He died where he was born, and for some reason I didn't put the place of birth in here. It was in Kinderhook. I was very close. Kinderhook, New York. So he was born in Kinderhook, New York. The country was no longer strictly a British colony at this point, but it was not yet a country either. So it's kind of in this in-between. I think I, I saw, I'm pointing that out because I saw a meme once that said he was the first president born when the country was a country, and that's not quite accurate um, because the country was not a country yet. We were still figuring out what the hell we were. So we start this recipe with, yes. Oh no, oh no, I forgot something. I'm gonna need this, hold on. Sorry about that, I'm back. Had to run downstairs and grab a opener for coconut milk. Okay, so we start with one and a half ounces of Bailey's Irish cream. So, born in Kinderhook, New York. He was, so he's the first president born after the revolution, but was definitely born before we were an official country. One and a half ounces of Bailey's. I think I did the thing again where I held the bottle in front of my face. Sorry about that. The Van Burens were not poor. They weren't scrounging poor, but they were not wealthy by any metric either. They were sort of a lower to, uh, lower to middle, middle class, okay? They were sixth generation Dutch immigrants, very much a part of the Dutch community in upper state New York. He apparently was, or came to be very good friends with Washington Irving. They shared a lot of the same interests and they were certainly both from upper state New York with that, that Dutch heritage and and so there was a lot of the personality you see in Washington Irving stories uh, like Ichabod Crane that was all very familiar to him he would he Van Buren would recognize the caricatures that were being portrayed in Washington Irving's work so fuck I'm out of shape stairs stairs take it out of me never get fat kids seriously so like all the Van Burens Martin's branch of the family was quite large his mother was already once widowed. She had two sons and a daughter from a previous marriage when she married Martin's father, Abraham, and had an additional five children, of which Martin was the third born. He was the first boy of that pairing, but the third born child. The family was very supportive of each other. They, they were very close. They earned their living by running an inn for travelers. And this allowed Martin to learn how to interact with a wide range of people, I mean, everything from the family's six slaves, so they were a slave owning family, to statesmen and wealthy people who just passed through town and needed a place to stay, their inn was the place to do it. So they were they were pretty well known for their area. 1.67 ounces of Malibu rum. That's a well, we went from centiliters to, to ounces, so that's pretty specific. One. There we go. It's specified Malibu rum because Malibu rum has coconut flavoring already in it, and this calls for coconut milk, and so we're just looking to kind of enhance that coconut flavoring, I think. So, Martin's mother believed in the value of an education. Martin was taught math and reading, but that's really all the family could do was that kind of local educational thing. They, there wasn't enough extra money to send him to school for formal schooling. So at the age of 14, he was apprenticed to a lawyer, Francis Sylvester. Now, the Sylvester's were very well off. They were influential. And Van Buren learned from Sylvester. Uh, he learned how, not just the law. I mean, he certainly learned that. That was going to be his trade. But he learned the importance of dress and how to dress to make an impression. 
he learned the fundamentals of the new political system that the United States had created and kind of where those fundamentals came from being the old Roman Republic. He learned all of that, but for all of that, because he knew he was not from the standard wealthy classes of which lawyers were typically made. And he remained self-conscious of his humble beginnings. And I think that, that kind of influenced him quite a bit throughout his life. I mean, it wasn't quite a rags to riches situation. Like I said, his family was middle class. It's not like they were absolutely dirt poor like Jackson was, and he truly was born poor. But I mean, remember they ended up being servants to other branches of the family. But for Brett Van Buren, it really was his own strength, his own adaptability, his own flexibility, and his own wits that allowed him to progress into a very successful law practice and eventually becoming a state senator in New York. Okay. Now, this is what I forgot. See, coconut milk can open. It's not going to open the whole thing and make a huge mess. Coconut milk. We need. 3.33 ounces of coconut milk. So we're gonna, we're gonna eyeball this through between three and 3.5 because I don't have scintillators on my measuring cup. Oh, that's getting quite full, lovely. Okay, we mix all this together. So you know we're seeing a trend here. I noticed a trend right away. All the presidents to date, I think except for Washington, all of the presidents started their career in politics as a lawyer. There's a reason Shakespeare said, first kill all the lawyers. So he started his career in politics as a lawyer. Now back then, while law school was nice, it was not a requirement to practice. That, that particular gatekeeping came into play much later in life. All the presidents prior to him went to law school before becoming a lawyer. He skipped the school part, apprenticed early, and was practicing law by 1803. He was only 20 years old. Remember, he was born in December. 1803 is going to make him about 20 when he, when he passed the bar and started practicing. Now, the Sylvesters, in addition to teaching Van Buren how to dress and the fundamentals of law, tried very hard to turn him into a Federalist. Van Buren, probably because of his humble beginnings, was more influenced by his own family leanings toward Jefferson's Republican Party. And he sort of chased that Jeffersonian ideal throughout the rest of his life. 0.83 ounces of cream. Not quite one ounce of heavy cream. It doesn't say anything about mixing it, so I'm just gonna float it across the top. Woohoo! Okay. Van Buren was, by all reports, an accomplished lawyer. Was well on his way to making his living strictly from the law. It just says sprinkled chocolate on top. It doesn't say what kind of chocolate. I'm just gonna do a pinch of cocoa powder. Apparently, that was a pretty heavy pinch. Okay, there we go. That's the magician. I will be drinking this throughout the rest of the, uh, the show and I'll let you know what I think about that too. He's well on his way to making his living strictly from the law. And so he married and, and he actually married fairly early. Most members of his family didn't marry till they were in their thirties. He married, he was about 24, 25. And he married his childhood sweetheart, Hannah. And when they were both, oh, they were about, both about 24 and began having kids like boom, 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 right after the other. They had five boys, four of whom survived to adulthood. Abraham, John Martin, Ju uh, John Martin, Ju Hannah, died on February 5th, 1819 at the age of 36 due to tuberculosis. Uh, they called it consumption back then, but it's the same thing. And that left him widowed with four children. He never remarried. I'm not sure if that was necessarily strictly love for her, although I think he did love her, uh, but he just, he enjoyed being a bachelor. He enjoyed that lifestyle. The magician is delicious. This is pretty damn good. That's a good cocktail. I'm gonna recommend that one. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so once he started jumping into politics, Van Buren realized that even within the individual parties, and there were several, I mean, I mean the, the Federalist, Anti-Federalist, and then the Federalist Republicans get all the press, but there were actually quite a few. There are actually quite a few today. They, again, just don't get the press, but uh, there was too much factional infighting. Hey, we see that again today too. But that makes accomplishing goals as a unit difficult. So basically that was his contribution to politics. He was part of creating something called the Albany Regency within the Republican Party of New York. He oversaw a faction called the Bucktails and that became the Regency and his gift was organization and they organized everything. Uh, no move was made without strict communication between everybody in the Regency about how this move would help the end goal of consolidating power and keeping the Republicans in place. 
okay? Now, I'm calling the Republicans now. Understand, in the 1820s, this shifts significantly, and they become the Democratic Party because the Republicans go away. I mean, they just vanish, essentially, during Monroe's presidency. But for now, they're the Republicans. And I, I, that gets addressed in uh, Lynn Cheney's book on Madison about how the Republicans back then, nothing like the Republicans of today. And very much true. So Van Buren was the first to put party above principle. So thanks for that. Uh, but he used this organization and wheeling and dealing to change how the state of New York was run during that state's constitutional convention during the spring of 1821. And the Albany Regency became kind of the gold standard by which other political factions and political parties set themselves trying to replicate that success. And this level of organization helped see Van Buren first into becoming a senator in the state of New York. And then from there, he was made senator of New York to the federal office in D.C. And that level of organization helped Andrew Jackson get elected. But it didn't come easy and it wasn't overnight because in the 1820s, Van Buren was trying to replicate his success as kingmaker. He'd managed to get his people elected to key positions. He'd managed to push out patronage, meaning instead of electing people for certain positions, they were appointed by the governor. So because that's not corrupt at all, just appointing your friends. And yes, that comes back to bite him in the butt. And that was funny. Um, but anyways, he's trying to replicate this. He's trying to become kingmaker on a more federal sc scale, all the while insisting that he's for a smaller state-centric government of the old Jeffersonian bent. And I wonder if watching Jackson grab that federal power and hug it close and be such an extreme nationalist, if Van Buren ever had a moment of reflection and wondered if he had just backed the wrong course with Jeff uh, Jackson. While building up the Albany Regency, Van Buren insisted that everyone had to pull together, vote the same, there could not be any division among the ranks and if they wanted to build a national level political party. And that would grab and retain power and dissension still happened because, you know, however much the Democrats would like us all to be the same, we're not. People are individuals. The first move Van Buren made in the decade was trying to revive the two-party system. And this is in the 1820s. He wanted that two-party system back. And it had effectively ceased to exist with Monroe and the White House. Uh, Monroe's eight years were known collectively as the era of good feeling and partisanship was basically a non-issue. I mean, just people didn't want to fight anymore. They just didn't care that they were just, nothing was so important that they were willing to put, put partisanship above anything. I feel like I may have ranked Monroe unfairly in retrospect, but anyway, for a power-hungry bureaucrat, such as Martin Van Buren, this will simply not do. So Van Buren decided his enemy would be anyone who did not support old-school republicanism, a la Jeffersonian style. And at least for now, that's his enemy. Among the many problems Van Buren wanted to fix was that for the first 40 years of the United States, 36 of those had been presided over a president from Virginia. New York thought this was unfair. Remember the, the four other years, and this is 1823, so the four other years, they were from Adams years, gentlemen from Massachusetts. And then the next four years would also be in Adams from Massachusetts. But still, New York hadn't been represented. Fucking New York. But in those same 40 years, New York had exploded. Population-wise and financially, it had become the manufacturing powerhouse of the Northeast, uh, just as Virginia's power was waning. I mean, tobacco crops had destroyed the farming in Virginia. Uh, the land was basically barren at this point and in desperate need of rejuvenation. Now, prior to leaving for Washington, Van Buren had succeeded in creating a two-party system in New York. There was the Republicanism that was still held very dear by him and the Clintonians, which was basically everybody else. I don't think there's any relation to the Clintons. I don't think. All right, maybe there is, I don't think so. But to help build up Van Buren's old-style Anti-Federalist Party, he turned to the Senators from the South, because that's where Anti-Federalism started, were those Southern states. And here is where he first became acquainted with the Richmond Junto, who basically, they based their power block off of his regency from Albany. And he first became acquainted with Andrew Jackson, who was voted in as Senator from Tennessee in 1823. Now, Jackson was not Van Buren's initial choice to be president. His candidate was William Harris Crawford. 
and that's who he backed in the 1824 election. Even after Crawford had his stroke, Van Buren was convinced that he had recovered, uh, Crawford had recovered enough to be able to lead the country, and the rest of the Regency didn't agree with him, and that caused the first rift. And this tiny bit of friction was just enough that when the 1824 election was held, Van Buren no longer had the full support of the Regency team. And this meant that the electors from the state of New York were split, which caused no one candidate to reach the required majority to become president, which kicked it to the House of Representatives, who voted in John Quincy Adams. Van Buren was livid over this. And on his return to Washington, he skipped most of his social calls. He was a pretty social, outgoing guy, but he skipped almost all of them because he was so angry he couldn't talk to the Regency anymore. He was that mad. And they felt it, too. They knew they were being spurned by him. I don't know if they felt guilt. They may have. I don't know. But he goes back to Washington. Eventually, he gets over it. And once he gets over his snit, he... he bounces back very quickly and creates this new national party, the Democrats, over the next three years. And that's pretty impressive. He organized a winning party in three years. And if there is any one thing to admire about Van Buren, his ability to bounce back after a setback is like, boom, right up there at the top, right? Everybody should develop that level of, of just boom. Realizing that he has lost control of the Albany Regency, he begins to reconsolidate his footing there from D.C. He's still senator down in D.C. So he's organizing this and maintaining his ties with the people in New York by a written communication. They didn't have email. They didn't even have the telegraph then. So everything was being sent by letters and couriers. Um, he makes nice with Governor DeWitt Clinton, who had formerly been a very staunch enemy, and begins to kind of lay the groundwork to back the next winning president, who he was determined not be John Quincy Adams. Um, he wasn't quite sure who yet. I mean, other books have indicated that he backed Jackson from the word go, but that does not appear to be the case. And after the Crawford fiasco, he was, Van Buren was a bit more cautious in who he would choose as the next run for president. Part of the problem, to, to me at least, seems to be an inherent inconsistency in his thinking. Van Buren claimed to be old school states' rights Jeffersonian Republican, but he couldn't come to grips with whether he should be placing state goals ahead of national goals. And if you're a state's rights advocate, you should be really placing state goals ahead of national goals no matter what. Ultimately, after fixing <laughs> fixing the state of New York, meaning he set it up so key posts were handed out by you know, patronage, he opted for national goals. And he turned his eye toward kingmaking in D.C., and eventually was convinced that Jackson was the man to oust Adams in the White House. And he decided that as early as 1826. So as early as 1826, Van Buren is actively electioneering for Jackson. It's two full years ahead of the official campaign season of 1828. And I mean, man, we thought we had it bad when they start going in like January of an election year. On the flip side, they did not have a 24-hour news cycle. And news took considerably longer to travel back then. Through all of this, Jackson's no fool. All right. he, he knew Van Buren had some game he was playing, but Jackson couldn't quite peg what it was. He couldn't see the end goal. So, I mean, I guess to that end, Van Buren was a pretty good chess player then. So, while, so for a while, it seemed that Jackson might court DeWitt Clinton as a player on his team and get Clinton's assistance in winning New York. And Van Buren didn't want that to happen. He wanted Jackson to, to owe him the success for New York. And then in a stroke of luck for Van Buren, Clinton dropped dead. Uh, no idea why, he just boom died. So now the only major political player in New York is Van Buren. And Jackson needed him because Jackson was a known member of the Masons. And right around this time, an anti-Mason sentiment hit a running high because of a fairly well-publicized murder. A, a guy who had been a Mason said he was going to post a tell-all book. And then they killed him. And so anti-Masonry was running very high at this point. Now, in addition to Jackson's being Jackson's man on the ground, this presented other opportunities for Van Buren, and he was encouraged to run for the now vacant seat of governor of New York, which he did, and he won. He was quite popular. And even despite the anti-Masonic sentiments of the northern and western parts of New York, he was voted in governor. And shortly after he was sworn in as governor, he was offered the position of Secretary of State in D.C. 
by Jackson, which was, at this point, it was seen as being the heir apparent to the presidency. So he resigned the governorship, returned to Washington. And as we know from the book on Jackson, he served as, Van Buren served as Secretary of State for Jackson's first two years in office before stepping down from that position and becoming Minister to England. Now, this book provides a little more detail regarding that event. The, the book on both Quincy Adams and Jackson indicated that it was Van Buren's idea and he presented it to Jackson as a way to get the rest of the cabinet booted out after the Peggy Eaton scandal. And that was part of it. I mean, I mean, there's no getting around that. It was certainly part of it. But the other part addressed in this book is that Vice President Calhoun was stirring up trouble and he was trying to lay the trouble at the feet of Van Buren. And the, the, you know, Washington rumor mills were going crazy and trying to blame Van Buren for all of this. Calhoun had already determined that he was not going to be seeking a second term as vice president under Jackson, but he was so incensed at Van Buren's political machinations that he wanted to take Van Buren down with him. So the rumor mills going and going and going, claiming that Van Buren is the one driving this wedge between Calhoun and Jackson. And Van Buren, because he was an incredibly wily political creature, sidestepped the entire issue by refusing to have anything to do with it. He just refused. When Jackson tried to get Van Buren to read some of the letters being sent to Jackson, Van Buren declined, saying, nope, I, I need to not have anything to do with this. I need to have a clear conscience. Basically, he wanted plausible deniability. And Jackson agreed. He said, okay, I, I trust your instincts. You're the magician. We're going to let that one go. And, um, I mean, he, he earned the nickname. He was exceptionally good at reading the winds of politics and directing traffic to victory after victory, including for himself. Now, after resigning as Secretary of State, Van Buren boards a boat to England. He's expecting to spend a year or two there as minister before coming back and being vice president. And he was well received. I mean, he was liked in England. He was a likable guy, apparently. I mean, most people enjoyed his presence, enjoyed his company. He was charming. He uh, was a well dresser. But there wasn't much for him to do. <laughs> this was an almost do-nothing job. I mean, he had already effectively negotiated when he was Secretary of State. He had had the minister under you know his and Jackson's direction open up ports between England, uh, uh, British West Indies, excuse me, and the United States. I mean, Bill, basically the only thing he did in the few months he was there was negotiate compensation for a ship that had come aground in British port. The ship had been a slave ship. British refused to hand over the cargo because Britain was like, no, we're not, we're not participating in the slave trade. We're not going to give these to you. So he negotiated payment to the ship owner. That was his, that was his great step to diplomacy in England. Oh, that and becoming liked and well known to King William IV and his queen. They, they liked Van Buren, they invited him to dinner and to social outings, and then sometime in late December 1831 or early January 1832, Van Buren receives word that his posting has not been confirmed by Congress, which immediately means he has to stop everything. He does not, he's not acting with any authority. He immediately presented himself and his regrets to the King and Queen, did a quick tour of Europe, and returned home to the United States. Now at this point, there wasn't much for Van Buren to do but wait and prep to election year because he's not senator. It's not an election year, so they can't reassign him to the Senate. He's no longer in the president's cabinet. Those positions have been filled by Van Buren's hand-picked successors. Yeah, he, he, he was pretty powerful. So he basically just had to wait out the year until they could officially vote him in as vice president in 1832, which, of course, they did. And as vice president, he was in a better position to rein in Jackson's nationalistic tendencies, kind of pulling him back on the force bill, which passed easily, but was thankfully never used. And he just kind of continued to walk that knife's edge between states' rights and Jackson's nationalism. And Jackson made it clear that he wanted Van Buren as his successor in 1836. Jackson wasn't going to follow Washington's tradition, only serve two terms, and then bow out and the 1836 election saw the finalization of that two-party system that Van Buren had worked so hard to reinstitute, with the Democrats on one side and the Whig Party rising up as their opposition. And the Whigs would hold power in that capacity for about mm, 20 years. The 1836 election was kind of where... Okay, so during Jackson's election, we already saw 
the start of like dirty politics, right? Because that's remember his Jackson's wife died as a result of the stress of being, you know, accused of being a, a red woman basically and not having any morals because she was still married when she married Jackson and that was all there. But this politics, the, this 1836 election, it took off and kind of became policy. Okay. The Whigs here kind of viciously attacked Van Buren. They accused him of being too effeminate because he was a you know well dresser and being an abolitionist, trying to kind of divide the Southern support. Be, you know, he was not an abolitionist. They accused him of being pro-banking, pro-nationalist. I mean, basically everything Van Buren really wasn't. They were trying to look for the way to make to divide that ticket because everything that Jackson was not, they said Van Buren was, and it wasn't accurate. Van Buren led the Democratic war machine fire up. And an interesting twist, rather than defining the things that Jack Van Buren did stand for, the party highlighted what the party stood for. And here we go. Because that's really all they had. I mean, Van Buren was so careful with his politicking that no one really knew what he stood for. I mean, he was a highly qualified and immensely capable politician always careful to not say too definitively what was meant, always hedging his bets, and leaving himself wiggle room on the translation of intent. And he was a consummate politician. And the entire section, like that entire section of the book was dedicated to showing the twists and turns Van Buren took to walk that tightrope between saying what needed to be said and saying what people wanted to hear. And he was very adept at this. He never actually committed himself in any way that might come back to bite him in the political butt. That's probably why he was called a magician. And of course he won in 1836, which allowed Jackson to retire. And as his vice president, he took the U.S. House of Representatives from Kentucky, Richard Mentor Johnson, which was an interesting choice. I kind of want to know more about this guy. Um, he was an interesting pick because while he was from a southern state, the South hated him. And it wasn't because he was necessarily an abolitionist, no. They hated him because he was openly doing what Southern landowners did privately. He openly kept a black mistress, openly, and he openly had children by her. That's blasphemy. And yes, Jefferson did it, but Jefferson kept it discreet and at home, right? They never left Mont uh, Monticello, Monticello, yes. They never left Monticello, right? Uh, Sally Hemings and all of her children stayed there. They never went to DC with him. Richard Mentor Johnson took his mistress and his kids with him, kept them with him in D.C. He was openly doing what all the Southern slaveholders were doing very privately. And they hated him for living that openly. So I kind of want to know more about him, but he, beyond mentioning this during the 1836 campaign, doesn't make a reappearance in the book. So that's all I know. Martin Van Buren was sworn into office on March 4th, 1837, and just about a month into office, he had to deal with a legacy problem from Jackson. And this is the problem that would basically define his entire presidency due to Van Buren's own short-sightedness, he didn't see everything, and his inability to see the forest for the metaphorical trees. The tree he focused on was a financial panic, which was brought about largely due to Jackson's outgoing executive order that public lands being sold could only be purchased for actual specie. What does that mean? So we know that the national debt was paid off during Jackson's presidency. All right. Part of the funding to pay off the national debt was achieved by the sale of land that was owned by the federal government to private individuals. And this is largely why states like Ohio are almost entirely privately owned. Only Jackson determined that the buyers could only buy with actual gold or silver coins, not paper money. Turns out paper is just paper. Interestingly, this may have been the one thing Jackson got right. And Van Buren was determined to cling to it. So that was the crux. But what actually happened? Between 1834 and 1836, the sale of federal lands resulted in a treasury surplus, I haven't had one of those in forever, of $16 million. Now that doesn't sound like much given today's trillion dollar budget deficit, but in the 1830s, that was a shit ton of money. Since the budget was now balanced and the federal debts were paid, this actually left Jackson in a bit of a panic because the money doesn't belong to the federal government. It's money that needs to be distributed back to the states for internal improvements. And Jackson was sure the states were going to turn around and loan that money to private speculators. Since the loans would be in paper money and credit, Jackson sought to circumvent this by declaring 
purchase of public lands must be made in gold or silver. And this was the infamous specie circular which was published. Uh, S-P-E-C-I-E, if anybody wants to look that up, okay? The banks reacted by calling due all loans, and a panic ensued. And that eventually led to a financial depression, with unemployment skyrocketing, soup lines were around the block, especially in heavy populated areas. So the northern manufacturing states were hit hard. So were the southern estates, because when the banks tried to force Van Buren to cancel the specie order, he wouldn't do it. Um, and he could do, he could do, right? It was an executive order, not a law. He was absolutely able to cancel that. He refused to, he held tight and refused that. And his whole presidency seemed to be about maintaining Jackson's status quo. And on the day of his inauguration, a prominent trading firm run by Isaac Hone stopped making payments. And a few days later, cotton houses in New Orleans began failing, and that began bankrupting the southern states too. Uh, due to just the just ending boom cycle of the economy, at this point in time, imports from England were greater than exports from the United States. This is not a good thing. There's no parity there. When the trading houses stopped making payments, England started demanding that their bills for imports be paid in gold or silver. They're no longer going to accept our paper money, which contributed to the panic and depression. This caused the banks to call due all loans immediately, which could then not be paid by the creditors due the loans were used making paper money and what was due was gold or silver. Real estate values plummeted. <laughs> Americans never learn. They don't teach history in school. Like 2008, it's just like 2021, right? We're seeing that boom cycle go on right now and it's gonna bust painfully. And through all of this, Van Buren is seriously just holding the line. And he's not necessarily wrong. I mean, people didn't see that because we don't teach economics any more than we teach history in school. Paper money is just paper. Gold and silver have actual value. Van Buren's response to all this was to try to push through an independent treasury, not a bank of the United States, but just an independent treasury. And that's basically what he spent his entire presidential term dealing with, the panic and trying to get that independent treasury. Completely ignored the rising calls for abolition of slavery in the North and, the, the, and thought that the Trail of Tears was humanely handled. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't quite a do-nothing president. I mean, he, he did not think we should annex Texas, believing that would lead to war with Mexico, correctly. And he made sure to maintain American neutrality when Canada made kind of a half-hearted bid for independence from England. But mostly it was the panic and the treasury. Those were his, his things. On September 5th of 1837, Van, uh, I think it was 1837, but he, he addressed both houses of Congress through a written communication, which was read out to them by one of his sons, where he pointed out that the Deposit Distribution Act of 1836 required the Secretary of the Treasury to stop using banks that refused to redeem their notes and specie. Basically, this act upheld the gold standard. Said, so, look, we, we can't have a fiat currency. We have to back our paper with something. And that's why paper money had any value at all. It said that this note worth $5 can be redeemed for $5 in gold coins or silver or whatever was backing that particular note. And any bank that did not pony up the cash on request was no longer eligible to do business with the federal government. Because if the bank is just handing out paper but doesn't have the money to back it, that bank is going to go under. As it should. Don't bail out banks, you freaking idiots. There may not be enough alcohol to deal with this mess today. Okay, so the species circular simply extended that act to all trade with the federal government must be made in gold and silver. He wasn't wrong. It's not backed by actual value, it's just paper. <sighs> Jackson was trying to make sure the government didn't end up with a pile of paper and no land to show for it. If the man did anything right, that was it. And Van Buren did right holding that particular line. And Van Buren correctly pointed out that by deviating from a value-backed currency, we had inflation due to money that was invested in lands was a temporarily unproductive investment. I mean, there's nothing, there's no increase in goods until it starts being farmed or something. There, there's, it's just land, okay? And he pushed for that independent treasury, which he did eventually get. 
after four years of wheeling and dealing, um, making friends out of former enemies to do it. And it cost him the election of 1840. Uh, seriously, it stalemated in Congress for the remainder of his term due to party politics. And the man wanted a two-party system that put party over principle, and he got it. Uh, it bogged his presidency down to the point that he failed to win that second term, losing out to William Henry Harrison in 1840. And with that, I, and he seemed to retire gracefully. Seemed to. He went to upstate New York. He'd purchased the home of one of the formerly wealthy elite families in his hometown who'd been kind of snobby to him, and he was immensely satisfied by that purchase. But he didn't quite retire. He continued to kind of control politics from behind the scenes and made two more attempts at the presidency. No joking. Um, he kind of half-hearted in 1844 when people indicated that, yeah, the, they're, they're starting to see the error of their ways and we really need you back. And then he lost the Democratic nomination to James K. Polk. And he felt kind of betrayed by that one, like Polk kind of stabbed him in the back. And then in 1848, he ran on the independent free soil ticket. Yeah, see... He was real good with that two-party system until they weren't giving him what he wanted, and then he ran as an independent on the free soil ticket. And then that one lost, and he withdrew into the partisan world of the Democratic Party. Continued to back the party. Uh, he, he mostly lived out the rest of his life at home in Lindenwald in Kinderhook, New York. He, he did do some traveling. He visited with friends. He made another trip to Europe, uh, taking his third-born Martin with him. Martin never married because he was sick his whole life. He basically had consumption as well. He fought it long, but he died in Europe in 1855, and then Martin Van Buren returned to the States, where he'd lived out the rest of his life in Lindenwald, dying on July 24th, 1862, having cast his last vote for president along strict party lines in 1860 for Stephen Douglas. And he wasn't a do-nothing person. I mean, he, he led a very active life. He certainly had a great deal to do with creating modern politics. And he had his opinions on slavery, which he supported as an institution when building up the Democratic Party, but eventually rejected when he was a candidate for the Free Soil Party. It's convenient. But following his retirement from the White House, I mean, the politician who had been known to his friends as the magician pulled his greatest magic trick of all and disappeared from history. I mean, no one knows who he is. I, I vaguely knew the name. I was talking to my father-in-law yesterday and he asked, well, you know, what are you doing the rest of the day? And I said, I'm finishing reading about Martin Van Buren. He goes, I don't know who that is. Said, well, nobody does. He's vanished. But he left a lasting legacy for which nobody seems to know who to blame. And I am here to tell you, you can blame Martin Van Buren, the eighth president of these United States for the current political clusterfuck that is the 21st century American politics. He is directly to blame for this two-party hellhole we find ourselves stuck in. I'm not quite sure where to rank Martin Van Buren on my personal list of presidents. I mean, I'm kind of, in, I mean, I'm trying to decline to chuck him at the bottom. I mean, like, even below Jackson, but I kind of feel sorry for the man. Um, I tend to look for the best for people, best in people, even in people who don't necessarily deserve it. It's my, I have a tiny little bit of optimism in the world and I, and I use it by looking for the good in people. Um, and I got to believe he genuinely thought he was doing good. Like if he knew that his legacy was going to turn into this, he'd be horrified. I got to believe that. I mean, maybe not. Maybe he'd think this is exactly what a two-party system was supposed to do. It was supposed to disenfranchise, you know, 60 to 70% of the population into not even caring anymore. But mostly, I think he was so concerned with making sure not to offend anybody that he failed to make an actual stand on anything. And what's that saying? If you, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything? I think I'm going to rank him just above Jackson. I, I think Jackson was maliciously bad. I really do. And Van Buren just wanted to fit in with the cool kids. And as a nerd, I can totally relate to that. So right now, he's second from the bottom but his drink is delicious. That's it for this week. If you liked what you saw, don't forget to share my videos. I will see you all next week.